we need to talk about Tiberius. I just put out a video about how to start with Critical Role, but I made some references to one of the players at the beginning of Campaign 1 who did not stay with the cast, Orion Akaba, and his character Tiberius, a dragonborn sorcerer. I didn't get into it too deeply, but I alluded to the fact that he did not stay with the cast long because he was kind of a problem player. This is sort of an appendix to that video. You don't need this, but if you're curious, or if you want my perspective on it, or if you think it may be valuable, we're going to talk a little bit more about Tiberius. Tiberius is a dragonborn sorcerer from the land of Draconia, which he will happily tell you himself. His catchphrase became, Hello, I'm Tiberius Stormwind from Draconia. Tiberius is often played as a bit of a fool. He's a bit inattentive to what's going on. He's a bit full of himself, sort of pompous, and not necessarily able to back that up with his own awareness of the world. But he is obviously very intelligent. He's a studied, learned man, and he is powerful in combat thanks to his magic. If this is all that Tiberius had been, he would have been wonderful. Would have been a fantastic part of the show. But that's not the case. Because of the player Orion Akaba, Orion, for reasons we'll get into, had some issues that presented themselves throughout the course of the show. He's only with the show for the first 27 episodes, but we're going to talk a little bit about some of the traits that presented themselves. First of all, he had some similar problems to Tiberius in that he was not necessarily good at communicating what was on his mind, but simply proceeded as if everyone was on the same page as him. This is not uncommon in D&D, &D, and we're going to do other videos about this, but this is something that happened and it frustrated the cast, including Tiberius, including Orion Akaba. Like, it's frustrating to realize you're not on the same page as other people, so that's... and no one was happy in that situation. Second, I think he suffered the most, mechanically, from the transition from Pathfinder into 5th edition. Now, you don't need to know the details of these games, we'll deal with those another day, but Pathfinder is a game that's a lot like D&D, especially a lot like the D&D that Matt Mercer grew up with, so it was a good place for him to start with the cast. Now, transitioning to 5th edition for a streamed show made a lot of sense because it was the most popular edition at the time because it was a huge success. It also helped from a branding perspective, and I think it was a better representation of their playstyle as it was for so many people. But this also meant that some of the rules changed around some of the character classes. The ones who suffered the most, I believe, are probably Vex and Tiberius. Scanlan got much more powerful, Keyleth got differently powerful? Her wild shapes got much more powerful. Everyone else stayed functionally very similar. Well, Percy had to be rebuilt completely because there were no gunslinger rules in D&D, but they had a lot more control over that. They could put their own hand on the lever that way. So there are multiple times during those Tiberius episodes where Orion expresses frustration at how a spell used to work or a spell he used to have access to that he no longer does. That sucks. I mean, it sucks as a watcher, as a viewer, but it also sucks as a player who's at that table, it sucks for Orion, it sucks for Matt the DM, that sucks overall. That's kind of a bad attitude to have when you're that player, but it's also understandable. We can appreciate why he felt that way, but I think that he just didn't verbalize it very well, or rather, he verbalized it a little bit too much. I think that this also speaks to a larger issue, and one that is, again, not uncommon, but was certainly uncommon at that table and was, I think, ultimately not at place in Critical Role, which was that he felt the need to win. He felt the need to be the most successful or to do the most cool stuff, to kind of go Nova in every combat that he could and use as much of the powers as he could. And this not only put him at odds with the mechanics, as he would run out of all of his cool stuff faster and need long rests more often, but it also put him at odds with the other cast members and with Matt, because he had this mentality of how to win the games, of how to win the fights, and sort of took it on himself personally to handle a lot of these things himself. Some of these can be explained by, again, what we discussed earlier about him not being on the same page as other people. Others speak to a sort of attitude problem, but some of them are also summed up by something that he sort of realized after the big combat in episode 11 with the first big boss of the show. He did not realize or did not internalize that the DM was not trying to kill them. The monsters are trying to kill them, but Matt was not their enemy in combat. Now, this should be obvious, but I will say this is a very common mindset in D&D. A lot of D&D players have this feeling. This comes from a lot of places. It can come from the legacy of the game, because there are definitely a history of adversarial DMs. While I don't believe Orion had played a lot of D&D before, 
that culture is still present. That culture can still happen anywhere. Even if you didn't grow up playing D&D or, or watch a lot of it, that's still something you can struggle with. Secondly, Matt is a old school gamer sometimes. He is a tactical gamer, a tactical player, and his goal is not to put them in positions where they're easily going to win or lose, but his goal is to challenge them. It can happen where you misinterpret what's going on, which is, I think, sometimes what he did, what Tiberius did, what Orion did. He interpreted situations as adversarial when they did not need to be and should not have been. And I think there is an element of video game influence as well, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more in future videos. As someone who didn't grow up playing video games, I think that it's easy for me to see certain behavior as problematic, but I think it would be perfectly valid in a video game. If you are playing video games, your goal is to win, and you are playing against a machine, a system that wants to kill you. In D&D, that system is your dungeon master, but your dungeon master is also a lot of things. And I will say, video games don't usually actually want you to lose, so that doesn't really excuse the mindset, it just kind of explains where it might have come from. There was another aspect early on where Orion presented himself as a problematic individual, and this one, controversially, I'm going to say that he was right in spirit and simply wrong in practice. As I mentioned, he had a bit of a catchphrase. Hello, I'm Tiberius Stormwind from Draconia. As the show became popular early on, a lot of uh, bootleg or unofficial uh, fan content went online, including shirts. One of them was the uh, Hello, I'm sticker with Tiberius Stormwind from Draconia written on it. You know, the same way you might get Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. It's a very silly shirt, but also both of those examples, the Inigo Montoya one and the Tiberius one, would kind of be illegal. Like, you're not allowed to do that. And Orion said as much. He said it was kind of not okay that this person was posting a shirt about his character without his permission, without his, his go-ahead. Should he have done that? I don't know. I personally don't think that the public forum was the best place to voice that opinion. And I think that there's another aspect to consider with Orion is that he had another show on Geek and Sundry. He was the only cast member who did. He had a show where he played video games, and I think he could pretty clearly see that Critical Role was a sensation that nothing else on the Geek and Sundry network came even close to. Early on, the cast of Critical Role announced that they had some shirts for sale on their website, and by the time they are finished announcing it, because remember, this is a live show, they discover that all the shirts have sold out. And they mention, oh my gosh, we printed 100, we, we thought that would be enough. And Orion is the only one who said, I have no idea why you guys thought 100 shirts would be enough. Don't worry, everyone, there will be more shirts. Because he was the only one, I think, who understood as early as he did the success of the show. However, this is, I think, also where the mentality shifts a bit. I mean, I don't know for sure, I don't know the man, but I think the fame went to his head. And additionally, as someone who's having his character broadcast to fans and has fans of his own now, well, now being 2015, but, you know, that was the mindset that he would have been in, I think it infected his character. He started to go Nova more often because I think he wanted the kills because it felt good not only to get a kill in D&D, and perhaps that was the only way he could do it because some of his older powers had gone away in the transition from additions, but also because I think he got a little bit of a high from the enjoyment of the fans. There was a choice of phrase there that I used that I think was unfortunate, but we'll come back to that in a second. You also get to see him starting to experiment, starting to get kind of brazen, starting to go on these other missions and side quests to like come up with cool inventions and things. And I wonder if that's because Percy was doing inventing and he felt left out or because he had these ideas of things to execute and no spells to represent them. So he wanted to come up with other ideas. He thought, oh, I can do a lot of damage with a cool bladed weapon if I use telekinesis on it. So I'll commission a cool bladed weapon. And goes on this very long, rambling objective to do that, and is way more excited about it than anyone else is. This can happen in D&D games, but it happens with Tiberius a lot. And while every once in a while it's genuinely funny, like the time that he tries to get access to a teleportation circle and kind of ends up going through like a Spectrum-style tree of talking to your boss's boss and boss's boss and boss's boss of like going to upper management, and that, that scene is funny. But oftentimes it didn't land that way. It was just him going on these long rambling missions of trying to uh, perform some sort of objective and he wouldn't necessarily tell the cast or even Matt what he was trying to build or create and that frustrates everyone. You know, Matt is frustrated that he can't help this player represent whatever he's trying to do because he doesn't really understand it and they're not on the same page about what's going to be involved. Orion's frustrated he can't just do what he says he's trying to do because 
there's these pesky rules in the way and he has to make these rolls for them. And he feels like he should just be able to do them because he, he asked for it and he thought it through and it makes sense to him. The cast isn't in the loops. So they're just waiting for him to finish this, this side quest, this mission, while they're just waiting and watching and being bored. And the viewers well, kind of polarized, I suppose. He had his fans. He had people who were on his side and were enjoying what he did, but others who were, yeah, they're just a little bored, a little annoyed as well. And there is a point where the character begins to do things that are kind of brazen and kind of inappropriate. He brutally murders someone in the middle of a fight, which I don't necessarily think he was wrong to do. I mean, they were in a fight, but that person was like retreating or asleep. I don't remember the exact details. It was also an old woman. And when Matt is trying to represent other people in the world being like upset by this because he's trying to portray the fact that this is a living, breathing world and their consequences have actions, Tiberius is very resistant to that, very defensive, and feels a little bit attacked by this. This is something that can happen at your home games. This is something that has happened at many people's home games in various forms. Maybe not murdering an old woman, but some version of representing friction between I did a cool thing in game, why are people mad at me, and the DM saying people are mad at you or frustrated by you because this is a living, breathing world, and these things matter. That's kind of an oversimplification, but without getting into the nitty gritty of the scene, that's kind of what was happening. Tiberius wanted to do cool stuff, and Matt was here often saying, but this is a world with rules, both physical rules of the world because we're playing a game, and also laws. And if you try to violate them, there are consequences. And there were some jokes that were not taken well. I don't want to sit here and defend jokes. I don't personally think they were worth defending. Point is, the other people at the table didn't like them. They did not like these jokes. This is episode 27. This is by far one of the worst, probably the worst Tiberius episode is episode 27. That's why I get very resistant when people say, oh, start with episode 24 and just jump from there. I don't know about that. Maybe watch episode 24 and 25 and maybe 26 and then just skip episode 27. I don't know, it's, it's rough. Now, additionally, this is in the era where crosstalk was a lot more common and eating at the table was a lot more common, but even once that had sort of been phased out, he was still doing it the most and the most often and the most noticeably. Now, maybe he was just eating at the table because he was busy, because he was coming off of other jobs. They were all still working voice actors. They would come in late sometimes. It did happen. Maybe he was on time, but he had missed dinner, and so he was eating at the table. I don't know. I can't speak to why. I just know that it happened a lot. When he did leave Critical Role, he eventually resurfaced, putting together his own projects about Tiberius and, like, his family of other Draconians. But it was very much designed to continue his brand and his franchise. Now, that's fine. That's ultimately up to him, whatever he wants to do. And if he felt that the group was not able to share focus in a way that he felt was right for his character, that is ultimately up to him. It is ultimately his decision to leave the show and try to pursue those in other ways. But that's another reason why I say that perhaps the fame went to his head. Now, there are some personal things that were going on with Orion that we need to address. One was that he was struggling with cancer at the time. I believe, I don't know the specific type, but I suspect that was part of the reason why he was on the eating schedule he was. Should he have figured out a workaround? Should they have changed the time? I don't know. That is a larger conversation. That is a factor, potentially. Additionally, about, I want to say, maybe a year after he left the show, maybe a little less, he put out a video where he talked a little bit about his behavior, both on screen and off. Now, he has no longer made that video available, so I won't get into all of it. It is ultimately his decision if that information is out there, but I will say that he was struggling with illnesses, and with addiction. Regardless of what was going on in his own life, regardless of who he was and how he presented himself, that is unfortunate and that's a bummer and that sucks. I wish that that had not been happening to him for any number of reasons. I wish that he had not been sick and I wish he had not been dealing with substances. And I genuinely feel bad for him that that was the case. But it also has to be acknowledged that other information has come out about him since then that he had, for example, done charity streams on his own and failed to deliver the money or that he had done some Me Too style crossing of lines with female collaborators in other projects. I don't remember all of the details, and ultimately I don't know if those were factors in why he left or his friction with Critical Role, I just know that those are things about him that, that have been addressed in the past. Hello, it's Editing Mike. 
I filmed this video and then I realized there was some more stuff that I left out that I think is actually pretty important. You know, it's funny, I think about Critical Role a lot, but I haven't gone back and watched a lot of the Tiberius episodes for, I think, somewhat obvious reasons. So there were some things that occurred to me after I filmed, like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's right, there was this as well. So I just wanted to cut myself back in, record some additional content, and give a little bit more clarity and context on some of Orion's behavior during the Tiberius period of the show. One thing that I didn't talk about that I really am surprised that I didn't is that Orion metagamed a lot. He would often talk about things in game terms more than he did in character terms, and he would somewhat factor in information that Orion wouldn't necessarily have access to. Now everyone has their own threshold for what is and is not appropriate metagaming at their table. There's always going to be some amount of metagaming, and some amount of metagaming can be good. That's a conversation for another day, and that's a much larger, deeper conversation. But there are some things that we kind of take for granted as metagaming, like your character understands that if they go into the dungeon they will be rewarded, and that they will find an adventure that they are probably roughly equivalent appropriate level four. That's metagaming, but that's also like how the game works. They understand kind of the, the way the world works on some level. But when you take that a step further is when you are trying to insert yourself into situations that you wouldn't have any reason to go to, except the fact that you as a player, Orion, know, oh, Tiberius could be really helpful here. That kind of thing happened a fair amount. I'm going to do a lot of videos about Critical Role, and I will have more Tiberius-related commentary because some things that he did we can learn from. We can learn from as dungeon masters how to handle players who do these things, and we can learn as players how to maybe not do some of these things, or how to do them in a way that's respectful to everyone else at the table. But one thing that is often talked about with Orion is his metagaming. Another thing, and I think this is actually worse, is how disrespectful he was toward the agency of the other players. I talked about this a little bit already, where he sort of assumed his plan was the de facto plan unless somebody said otherwise. He sort of assumed he could just do whatever he wanted until somebody pointed to him and said, hey, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And then he'd be forced to explain it. And he always seemed a little bit frustrated that he had to explain his mentality, which seems ironic. You'd think that both for a character like that and for a player like that, you kind of get some enjoyment out of presenting your plan and how intelligent it is, but I think he more wanted to have the reveal moments. I've played with a lot of players like this. This is not a unique to Orion problem. It's not even always a problem. It's just a certain fantasy that you're trying to fulfill. It's the fantasy of being the smartest person in the room. And some ways you can do that is by laying out all the options. That's generally how I do it when I'm a player, because this is a fantasy that I have when I play like a wizard or something. But the other option is to just do a plan because that's more cinematic, is to be like, aha, at the end, look, look at what I did. But for a game like Dungeons & Dragons, that tends to lead to more friction with other players. So that's kind of what happened with Orion. But there is another example of this that I did not mention that I am kind of surprised that I didn't. Again, these are things that uh, you, you just don't think about as much when you're in the middle of recording, but afterwards you realize you left out some pretty big moments, which is that Sam, Scanlan had an item that Orion felt that Tiberius would be able to use better. It doesn't matter whether or not he was correct, he could make a compelling argument for it, and that's what was going on in his head. He saw this item that Scanlan was not using and felt, well, I should use that because I would get more benefit from it. So he asked Scanlan to trade the item with him. I believe he asked three episodes in a row. The first time he asked, Sam was not present. Orion asked Scanlan, as played by Matt, if he could switch items with him. That's incredibly rude and disrespectful. Now, this is something that I think Critical Role struggled with a lot during Campaign 1, which is they would try to have conversations with the other party members when they were played by Matt as if they were still the same character. Even though they were fully aware Matt has to do some legwork, Matt has to do some work to justify certain behavior that wouldn't necessarily be the same case if the player was present. For example, there are many times when the party asked Pike to come along with them and Matt is saying, no, no, Pike can't come with you. Sometimes it's kind of joking and sometimes it's kind of serious. This is the first time that I can think of where it was a real problem and it was an Orion example. It's not the last time the party does it, it is just 
one of the most egregious in my mind. Because unlike saying, oh, Pike, come along on this adventure with us, it's trying to get something, get a magic item, take a magic item from someone else's character sheet. That's rude. He also, Sam had the item card, the piece of paper that had the description on it, so what, Orion just assumed he knew well enough what the item did that he could just pretend that he had the card? Yes, actually, that's exactly what happened, because that's what happened when he ended up getting the item. Eventually, he did trade with Sam, and it led to a scene that I think a lot of people think was very funny, which is a scene where Orion writes on a chalkboard the number of times that Scanlan's used the item versus the number of times that Orion has done something, or Tiberius has done something, where the item would have helped. And a lot of people thought this scene was really funny, and I did too at the time. I don't think it's funny anymore. And I think the problem is that I don't see Tiberius or Orion as really being in on the joke. I think he's just kind of talking down to Sam slash Scanlan. Maybe that's just because now we think less of Orion than we did at the time. This is halfway through his run as Tiberius and the more egregious stuff was yet to come. Although I'd argue trying to trade with a player when they're not present at the table is pretty egregious. But also, I, I just don't think he's in on the joke. I just don't, I've rewatched it, and I just don't think it's that funny anymore. I don't know. Personal preference, I guess. Another thing that I really did not talk about was that Orion had a subplot where he was kind of romancing Allura, the wizard that the party knew. And this was reciprocal. There was some definite interest expressed from Allura. But also, their first adventure, they go and they rescue Lady Kima from the dungeons in the Underdark, and they bring her back to Allura, and there is a definite implication that the two of them have a, at least a romantic history or a romantic interest in each other. And Orion got really butthurt about this. Like he felt like he had, oh, oh, I guess I lost my chance. And he like pounded the table and went, really Matthew? I'm not gonna show the clip, but it's weird and gross because there is a level of entitlement present there. There's a feeling that there is a expectation that he was going to get the girl. And Matt says, what? They're friends. But Orion is still like annoyed because, oh, I guess, I guess the girl I like is gay. Now, while I think that behavior was a form of homophobia, I don't, I'm not here saying that Orion was homophobic, but what he was, was feeling very entitled to a romantic subplot. And the moment, the moment that he felt like it wasn't going to happen, he got very pissy about it. That is some gross dude bro entitlement right there. Now in later episodes, Matt had renewed interest from Allura in Tiberius, so they continued their storyline for a few episodes until Orion eventually left the show, but that always bothered me, the way that he reacted to that. Like, Allura could just be interested in both of you, and that could be like some interesting drama to play out. No, you feel like you're owed a romance? Okay. Cool. Now, these are the things that people generally discuss when we look back at the Tiberius era and his problems. The metagaming, the gross behavior, the trying to switch with other players. This is the stuff that we talk about. There's something else, though, that I remembered that I cannot believe is not part of the conversation more often. A few episodes before he left the show, Orion was gifted a vest, like a long draping vest that was very much, it was deliberately the same style as what Tiberius wears in his character art. And for the final two episodes he's on the show, Orion just wears this to set. Now, I understand where that's coming from, and in theory that's no different than Liam wearing a leather bracer for an episode because he got it from a fan. Or having a dagger at his desk because he was given it by a fan. Same with Travis. Same with Taliesin having a fake gun that he opened up. You know, like, these are things that the cast was gifted by fans who were passionate, and I understand them having them at their desk or even wearing them for an episode or two. But again, he just wore this same article of clothing to be more like Tiberius twice in a row. And I, I don't know. I mean, how else do I describe it other than he was starting to get a little drunk on the Kool-Aid? But a few episodes before that, he had another example of very similar behavior. A fan gifted him a wrist-mounted flamethrower and he wore it on set two weeks in a row. Just on his wrist, just a thing full of lighter fluid with an ignition element on it. And I understand that based on some of the other things that we know about Orion after the fact that he has 
I would guess an addictive personality. I understand that. I do too, to a certain degree. I love having totems that represent the characters and I get very attached to them. I, 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 again, I understand where a lot of this came from, but as we can kind of deduce from the reason he left the show, he had a boundary problem. And in this case, I think he was doing things that were pretty unprofessional. Tiberius, you do not need Orion genuinely did that on accident. Orion, you do not need to wear the clothes of your character twice in a row. You definitely do not need to have a flamethrower on your wrist. Especially, and this, especially since so often during combat, Matt is trying to impart upon you the dangers of using fireballs near your friends. Like, it is a lesson that he had to learn a couple of times is that fire the default solution that Tiberius often used was not the right answer for everything. And yet, after he'd already had this encounter a couple of times with Matt, after he'd been over the rules of Fireball a couple of times and had to be reminded that if he cast it too close to his friends, he would hurt them, he, the player, had a literal Fireball creator on his wrist. Like, a fan thought it was a good idea to give it to him and he thought it was a good idea to wear it to set two weeks in a row. It's baffling to me that that is not part of the conversation more often. And I think we just forgot that he did that, but he did that. I also wanted to say a little bit more about the t-shirt. You recall that I mentioned Tiberius had a catchphrase, that this catchphrase was put onto a t-shirt by a fan, and that Orion expressed some frustration and, and basically pointed out that that was a copyright breach. But what I had forgotten was that Travis intervened. Travis pointed out to the fan, no, 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 don't worry about this. We were all big fans of your shirt. And that happened in between Orion's final episode and the first one without him. That was in that week. So I'd forgotten that that was a big part of the speculation was that, you know, Travis, as the person who would eventually become the CEO of Critical Role and probably had a similar role within the group at that point, or perhaps rose to that occasion in this event, had to intervene and had to point out that this behavior was not appropriate. I think that Travis probably realized that they were a pretty young brand at that point. And to put yourself out there as someone who wanted to shut down fan content was not a good look for Travis and potentially for the rest of the Critical Role cast. What Orion was doing at that moment was harming their relationship with the fans. And again, because that happened after Orion's last appearance on the show and before he left the show or potentially around the time, that is often pointed to as a reason why he was asked to leave. If he even was asked, he may have realized at that point, we don't see eye to eye, and it may have been very clear to everyone at that point. We don't really know. We probably never will know. But that was just a little bit more context that I wanted to make sure to add. Now back to regular previous Mike, whose beard is a little bit less shabby. And that's it. That is effectively what happened with Tiberius and with Orion Akaba. Now there are some postscripts to this. Tiberius appears in the first seven issues of the Critical Role comic. The first six were designed as an origin story for the cast that is canonical with their games. The idea is that this is how the group met, and Tiberius, of course, is a part of that. It makes perfect sense. But they did the first six issues as a miniseries, and in between those six issues and when they went on to do the next batch, a little Kickstarter had happened, and they had, um, gone ahead and greenlit a full cartoon based on the story of Vox Machina, which they were very open in saying that Tiberius would not be a part of. It was even in the Kickstarter FAQ. Makes perfect sense. I mean, whatever the friction had happened, whatever the issues were, he was no longer a part of Critical Role, so it didn't make sense to have him there. That's why in the next issue of the comic that came out, Tiberius very quickly goes, oh, all right, now I'm off to go do other things, goodbye! He sort of becomes this interesting footnote that no longer makes sense to include in the adaptation. The same way you might point out that the first mission that the group went on, the first home game they played, Taliesin did not play Percy. He played a blue dragonborn paladin, I believe. We don't know anything about this character, and everyone who wants to know is sort of met with disappointment because they basically regard that character as a footnote. Again, the thinking at that first game was not that this was a campaign, it was a one-shot. As soon as it transitioned into a campaign, as soon as this became an ongoing story, Taliesin wanted to play something different. That was not a character he wanted to carry on with indefinitely. So now, whenever that first mission is referenced, either in the story of Vox Machina video or in the comic book when it makes a brief appearance, we don't see that blue dragonborn because he doesn't matter. Not relevant. Likewise, so has Tiberius essentially become 
kind of equivalent to that Blue Dragonborn. The legacy of what Vox Machina is, the legend of Vox Machina, pun intended, no longer includes Tiberius. The story of Critical Role book that recaps the entire history of how Critical Role became what it is refers to Tiberius as a guest star. Now that was not the case, but that is the new narrative. And I think I understand why. You know, I don't, I can't speak to everything that happened behind the scenes, but I don't disagree that a change needed to be made. And while it's easy for us to say, wow, we start really getting to know Percy once the Briarwood arc starts, and I think that's true, I think also we start getting to know Percy a lot better once Tiberius leaves. Once Tiberius is no longer sucking up so much of the air and going for every joke he can, suddenly Percy, you start to realize he's actually really funny, and he has been the entire time, but we just didn't notice. His dry humor, is, his wit is a lot more subtle, and it's suddenly able to shine a little bit more. Anyway, that's the Tiberius situation. And for those who are curious, for those who want a sort of a comprehensive look at how it all went down of what we know, there are a lot of people who still sort of wonder what happened and what behind the scenes was the breaking point. And while I have my guesses, you can kind of see in that last episode that Travis is pretty fed up with it. And I would suspect he spoke for the group in that moment. But anyway, that is the story of what happened with Tiberius. I'm going to do more videos about Critical Role. I will occasionally mention Tiberius. I might even say nice things about Tiberius, but I think ultimately Orion was a problem player. And I think that sometimes the only way to deal with that after you've tried other methods is to really have a heart to heart and figure out, are you getting what you want out of this? Because we are not. We are not on the same page as you. What is it that you're hoping will happen? What is it you're hoping to accomplish? because I don't think we're on the same page. And I will say that the cast has a lot of affection for Tiberius as a character, regardless of their feelings about Orion. And while I do think that Tiberius had a significant role in that first campaign, as the subsequent adaptations and the narrative of that story have proven, his role was not critical. Well, that's it. I think after that pun, I have to delete my YouTube channel. So uh, please, while you can, hit the like button and subscribe because I'm gonna keep putting out videos until the YouTube gods discover I made that pun and, and come for me. You can leave a comment below if you want, but just know that I am, I'm trying to be respectful of everyone involved in this situation. I mean, no one has really spoken of this publicly with the exception of Orion, and even he can't really speak publicly about it. And the one statement he did make has since been withdrawn. So for the respect of those involved, we're not going to, I'm not going to speculate a lot more than I already have on the situation. But this is a complicated subject, and if we want to talk about it a little bit more in the comments, we can, and um, I look forward to that. Thank you so much for watching, play fair, and have fun.